one has to go back to the early development between the infant and the mother. And uh, this would take a long time to, but to condense the important features of it for our purpose. Uh, the infant does develop very early an attachment to the mothering person. And this becomes a very important, sensitive, again, a mutuality, because the mother has to bond with the infant as well as vice versa. And it develops that the, it takes about three years before the infant becomes a mature enough child for the completion of their psychological birth in contrast to their somatic birth. When the cord is cut, they're breathing on their own. They could be thinking uh, in a way of feeling fairly consistently certain about themselves with uh, enduring sense that they could survive absence and loss and uh, but still be connected with the mother. Um, so they develop a sense of pretty much a beginning identity at that point. Um, anything that threatens the attachment is distressing to the infant. If it goes on for anything than a momentary time, uh, Infants have a way of dealing with this largely through play. For example, just to give you an example, Freud noticed with his grandson, who was about three and was in the crib, and he had a spool attached to a screen, uh, string, and he would throw this spool over the edge of the crib and reel it in. Now, Freud was observing this because the child's mother was out shopping and the child was alone and it would throw the spool over the crib edge and say gone, the German word for it, for gone, and then it would reel the spool back in and say here. Freud interpreted this as the little boy's mastery of the absence of his mother, that he was able to get this substitute object, throw it away, and to bring it back in. Uh, children have a way of developing objects, teddy bears, ways of comforting themselves, but attachment and loss is a very important thing, and it has to be worked out so that eventually one becomes, finds one's own ways of feeling a sense of continuity of oneself in the absence of the important person. Now, this particular patient, if I were talking with her and I would happen to be looking down at the folds of my trousers, just taking my eyes off of her would immediately precipitate a blow up. That was so difficult for her that she could not stand to it. So she would attack and that would bring me back into contact with her in a very concrete way. And she would do this very frequently as a way of solving the absences. If she found that she could stir up a fight with someone, or if she could break a glass and hear the chips fall, she knew she was safe. Uh, she was so disturbed that uh, they would want to recess her from the seclusion room to the bathroom. The aides would 
by the time they got her to the door of her seclusion room, she was in such a fight with them that she would be pushed back into the seclusion room and they would close the door. Now, after this happens, you know, many, many times, one tries to inquire, what is she thinking? And I put together the following story from her. When she was approached by the AIDS, she would have a series of thoughts which she called the avalanche. The avalanche would start with, sure, I'll go out and I'll go to the bathroom. And then first thing you know, they'll want me to be wearing my clothes. And then they'll want me to be playing cards with people and going out on the grounds. And then they'll make me an outpatient and then I'll be outside and I'll be all alone. And I can't survive. That avalanche would terminate in an explosion, much like an avalanche. And the response of grappling and feeling the people pulling on her arms and pushing her back, all that helped define her, much as an infant will feel reassured when the mother holds the infant. You know that with an infant, it's almost no matter what is distressing the child, if you pick it up and hold it, it relieves it. Now, you have to get at the cause. If it's hungry, you have to feed it, but at least momentarily. And so often, much of the violence in patients is a help to define themselves and to engage, even if it's in a self-destructive way, to call forth a response. It's insane, sure, but it works for them at the time. You have to engage with them. You, you facilitate a relatedness, and the patient, too, is trying to facilitate that. And from that standpoint of an established relatedness, you help the patient see if they could find another way to contact people beside explosive behavioral outbursts. What has not been as much emphasized is that the anger itself provides a way of reconstituting the relationship with the other person. These people are often, as basically all of us, are often concerned about losing our sense of who we are, our sense of existence the fear of becoming attached will lead us to fuse with the other and be lost into nothingness. Now, when they start to attack or become angry, that tends to terminate this sense of loss and separation. And this is what I've termed as warmth by friction in contrast to warmth by love, where people who are mature enough can enter a, into a loving relatedness, a reciprocal, respectful interaction. When your concern is that such attachment will result in your feeling lost, swallowed up, dominated, enslaved. You react by fighting back, which puts you into contact. It ends the separation, but also preserves the distance. And so that 
distance attachment issue is quite evident in the paranoid person who doesn't simply ignore his adversary, but stays connected to the adversary, but in an oppositional way. So he's not threatened with feeling enslaved, lost, or gobbled up into nothingness. And it's a very interesting part, and I think that basically all of us at some level must sometimes experience this. It accounts for much of the endless bickering that goes on among couples. You'd think, well, my God, why don't they separate or leave? No, they, they, they serve a function for each other by warmth. Not warmth by loving relatedness, but by friction. <laughs>